Hello, I'm Joan Melton. Zach Bradford, Jessica Lee and I did a study on the acoustic characteristics of vocal sounds used by professional actors doing classical material without microphones in outdoor theatre. To date, relatively few studies have focused either on performance techniques or on the kinds of sounds that work in outdoor theatre. In 2002, Rothman, Brown and Lafond did a study on spectral changes due to performance environment and found the space in which we record professional voice users to be a variable that can affect results. So following Rothman's lead, the space for the current study was Central Park and participants in the study were actors from New York Classical Theatre, an award-winning off-Broadway company that has produced major works in the parks of New York City for over 20 years. Eight actors, four women, four men, ranging in age from 30 to 64, recorded a one-minute classical monologue each in stationary and moving conditions. Four of the eight recorded two monologues each from productions in which they had played both male and female roles. Monologues chosen were from the works of William Shakespeare and Oscar Wilde, and each actor's recording session was 15 minutes in length. Actors arrived early to do a physical vocal warm-up in the environment, and the recording site was a playing space regularly used by New York Classical. Monologues were performed as in a full production, first standing still, then moving freely within the context of recording cables. Each actor wore an omnidirectional headset microphone, five centimeters from the mouth, and a standing mic was placed 30 centimeters from the subject. Recordings from both microphones were stored in waveform audio files. An R vowel sustained for seven seconds was recorded at 30 centimeters from the mouth of each subject. The decibel of the vowel was measured by a C-weighted sound level meter and announced in the recording for calibration of sound pressure level. From the recordings, we obtained the range and average of fundamental frequency and sound pressure level, and long-term average spectrum for both gender and performing conditions. Here is a glimpse of the recording environment and the character of Richard II, ably performed by one of our participants. Cover your heads and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence. Throw away respect, tradition, form and ceremonious duty. For you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you, feel want, taste grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me I am a king? The fundamental frequency range used by participants was 75.38 to 530.33 hertz. So nearly three octaves and similar across gender and performing conditions. Average fundamental frequency increased from stationary to moving in both genders. Males had greater sound pressure level values than females. Both genders showed a peak between 3 to 4 kilohertz, or the actor's formant, and the peak was higher in male than female voices. Average sound pressure level for all actors was above that of ambient noise in the park, which was 80.15 decibels. Central to the performance of classical material is the actor's ability to fully embrace the language of playwrights like Shakespeare and Wilde. The critical role of unvoiced consonants, for example, manifests in the three comparative Eltis analyses noted on the slide. Version 1 included vowels, all consonants, breaths and pauses. Version 2, vowels, all consonants, but no breaths or pauses. Version 3 included voiced sounds only, so no voiceless consonants, breaths or pauses. Removing breaths and pauses had relatively little effect on Eltis. However, removing breaths, pauses and voiceless consonants tended to lower the energy around 3 kHz and above. When asked about observed differences between stationary and moving, actors said they were more comfortable and felt more empowered when they were able to move. However, movement in the context of a play is considerably different from that of the recording setup. Indeed, one participant doubted that isolated recordings could capture the sounds of performance 
because actors are trained to respond to everything around them, including the audience. Moreover, as audiences are farther away from the performers than microphones were placed for the current study, recorded data are not representative of what most audience members hear. In a 2018 study entitled Intelligibility of Long Distance Emergency Calling, Tietze, Blake and Watzak solved this problem by using four responders and sound level meters at four distances from the caller to examine the identification of calls across distance. While performers in outdoor theatre are not emergency callers, the vocal sounds they produce communicate with audiences across distance. Hence a follow-up study with the responders in several locations is being planned with the hope that it may provide greater accuracy and a broader perspective on the sounds produced. To summarize, we recorded professional actors in an outdoor theater space, found that along with vocal loudness, fundamental frequency range, the actors' formant, articulation and movement were important to successful performance and a perceptual study with responses from several distances is now projected. Many thanks for your attention.